even if you use other software to create models or draw with paper and pencil, this demonstration should provide you a thorough examination of the Tuscan column according to Vanola. In this presentation, we will examine the features of a Tuscan column and study the proportions and parts that define the simplest and most masculine of the five Roman orders as articulated during the Renaissance. You will learn to recognize its elements and how to form its details. This example, taken from W. W. Turner's 1930 book, Fundamentals of Architectural Design, is based on the features developed by the Renaissance architect Giacomo Barozzi de Vinola. Note that modern architects may follow several variations of each classical order. For your understanding, it is essential to note that the ancient Greeks and Romans had many variations, yet all based on the same principles of the system that they developed over hundreds of years. Here is a completed Tuscan column, which I created with one inch parts. Due to one inch parts, this column measures 35 feet tall, which equals about 10.7 meters high. We will shrink it down to 8 feet tall. The purpose of illustrating the scale is that in classical architecture, everything is proportionate. This column is the same whether it is 8 feet high or 10 meters tall. Grasp this concept to understand the power and flexibility of the classical building system and why it commands the bedrock of Western architecture. From Turner's book, we will reference these illustrations for the design of a Tuscan column. He has delineated the precise measurements to study Vinola's interpretation. All features in classical orders rely on the diameter of the base of the column, which divides into 60 parts, though the column tapers inward at its upper elevation. I will explain more about this feature, called intices, in just a moment. In this graphic ruler, we set up a division that demonstrates 60 parts of one diameter. Your parts can be 1 inch or 1 centimeter, or any other measurement you wish to utilize to design the column. In my SketchUp model, I used 1 inch parts. I employ the Imperial Measurement System because I live and work in the USA. Most of the rest of the world measures with the metric system, but it does not make a difference which measurement system you use. The column will be identical. And I'll show you how to resize this model to any scale you desire. Instead of referring to inches, I will call my measuring units one part. Also, take note, one module in classical architecture is one half of a diameter. Therefore, one module equals 30 parts. We will use this scale bar to maintain the correct division of parts as we progress through assembling the profile of the column. And you will see in a moment that we have the bar in a vertical position to assist us as well. First, let us look over Turner's details of the base of the column. The lowest element of all columns is the plinth, which is a block that is square in plan, 15 parts tall and 82.5 parts across. Keep in mind, half that figure, 41.25 parts, as we will develop just half the column to model it. The torus, synonymous with a bull nose, sits atop the plinth block at 12.5 parts tall. Note that the torus is as wide as the plinth, but it is cylindrical in plan. A fillet tops the torus at 2.5 parts in height. Note that the fillet begins at 7.5 parts inward from the plinth. In this context, a fillet is a small vertical plane that also follows the round cross section of the column. The shaft meets the fillet with a conge, a quarter round concave shape that elegantly transitions into the 60-part column base. While the base and the capital of the Tuscan column are 30 parts tall each, the shaft is 6 diameters tall for a total column height of 7 diameters. Per the initial example, the 60-inch column diameter translates to 420 inches in total height. 420 inches equals 35 feet. 
As mentioned earlier, a classical architectural column shaft always tapers inward toward its top. The taper is referred to as the entesis and serves to prevent the optical illusion of concavity that a vertical-sided column produces. Vinola and other Renaissance designers established that just the lower one-third of a column be vertical and the top two-thirds host the entesis. Keep watching to see how Turner explains creating the taper. It is remarkable. As a side note, some Greeks designed columns with a full height entesis. As for the capital of the Tuscan column, it comprises several simple though confident details that confirm its masculine character. From the top, consider the abacus and its fillet as a structural square block in plan on which the roof structure or entablature of the classical order rests. At 73 parts in total width, it extends well beyond the column shaft, but not beyond the column base. Its fillet is 2.5 parts tall and transitions into the vertical plane of the abacus with a conge. The abacus is 7.5 parts tall with a horizontal indentation from the fillet of 2.5 parts. The echinus, right below the abacus, is also 7.5 parts in height but begins at 3.25 parts inward from the far edge of the abacus. The echinus is round in plan and exhibits an overlow shape, which is the opposite of a conge because it is a convex, roughly quarter round detail. Moving down, we find another 2.5 parts tall fillet at 10 parts inward. Another conge transitions to the 10 part tall necking and is 12.5 parts inward. These features complete the capital. Yet, we have two more moldings that sit atop the column shaft. On top is the 2.5 part tall astragal. This second bullnose detail then protrudes outward from the necking and is 8.75 parts inward from the far edge of the abacus. At 10 parts inward, we reach our final tiny 1.25 part tall fillet that meets the shaft with one last conge. The top of the Tuscan column in Turner's illustration is 48 parts in width which makes it just shy of 5 6 of the 60-part column-based diameter. Many references place the entesis proportion at the 5 6 ratio, which would make our example miss by two parts. Some contemporary designers prefer the taper on the Tuscan column configured to 7 8 to produce a bolder profile. To faithfully follow Turner's illustrations, we will maintain the proportions indicated. Now that we studied all the parts and dimensions of the Tuscan column, we will begin to create the SketchUp model. We refer back to the scale bars that we set up to measure off the column pieces. Use light dashed guidelines to establish the parameters of each part. First, mark the center line of the column and its lowest horizontal element, which is the bottom of the plinth. You may have noticed that the vertical scale bar indicates one module or 30 parts at the bottom and the top and six diameters between them. Construction of the profile takes place within these seven diameters. The column base is 30 parts tall, so we set that first and refer back to Turner's illustrations as necessary. Recall half the width of the plinth equals 41.25 parts. Set that guideline. Then place two more guidelines 15 parts tall each, and then come down two and a half parts for the fillet height. Make a rectangle for the plinth, and then make a 180 degree vertical arc above to mark the torus. Remember, we must follow horizontal dimensions as well as vertical dimensions. Checking Turner's illustration, we confirm that the fillet sits 7.5 parts inward from the plinth edge. It is fascinating to note that the fillet begins beyond the tangent of the torus arc. Zoom back out 
and set the guideline for the top of the column. Then, set a guideline for the height of the capital, which is 30 parts, or one module. Make a rectangle to indicate the capital and a rectangle for the shaft of the column. Also, while we are here, take note that the shaft sits at 11.25 parts inward from the plinth. Now, go back to the base and insert the congé, which is simply a quarter arc perpendicular to the fillet and tangent to the vertical line of the shaft. In SketchUp, it is easiest to use the circle tool, making a 3.25 part radius, and then remove the construction lines to proceed. The radius of the congé is 3.25 parts, which is the horizontal difference between the fillet and shaft from the outer edge of the plinth. If you stuck out this crazy video, please click the YouTube like button because you earned a star for getting to the part where you learn how to form the taper of the column. Yes, time to master the entesis. Turner offers this method to derive the correct subtle curvature of the upper two-thirds of the column. First, you make a 180-degree arc, or circle, within the lower shaft of the column to establish point A. Second, you make a guideline at six parts inward, which is the innermost position of the tapered column. Point B. From the center of point X, draw a segment to point B. Then, divide the remainder of the arc into six equal segments. At the intersection of the arc and those six segments, place a vertical guideline through each one. So, how on earth could this work? Let us go back to our SketchUp column profile and start to plot this equation. Divide the column shaft into thirds. I will repeat the above procedure as we draw in SketchUp. First, you make a 180 degree arc within the lower column shaft to establish point A. You can see that I used a full circle, which is easier because I can eventually erase the extraneous lines. Second, you make a guideline at six parts inward which is the innermost position of the tapered column, point B. From the center of point X, show a segment to point B. Then divide the remainder of the arc into six equal parts. At the intersection of the arc and those six divisions, place a vertical guideline through each one. Now, divide the upper two-thirds of the column into six equal parts and place horizontal guidelines for each one. This construction is where the magic happens. When you select the SketchUp Arc tool, click the point at the top of the lower third of the column. Then place the end point at the highest point of the column shaft and carefully trace your arc to meet the points where the six horizontal guidelines meet your six vertical guidelines. You may need to tell SketchUp to give your arc a large number of segments, at least 48, because the default arc will have too few segments. We will check that our arc passed through those intersecting points. Number six. Number five. Number four. Number three. Number two. And number one. We will also go down to the point where we place the starting position of the arc that forms the entesis, which we can see is vertically tangent with the lower third of the column shaft. Once we have established the column taper, we can now erase the construction lines and guidelines that aided in forming these details. It is time to tackle the construction of the capital of the Tuscan column. You may recall from our earlier review the names of the parts and their dimensions, but let us take a quick look back at Turner's illustration. Critical here is that the capital is 30 parts tall, and the astragal and the fillet below the neck are considered part of the column shaft, and therefore are underneath that 30-part capital portion. 
we will return to the box we established earlier to begin the formation of the capital. Set your guidelines. Half the width of the abacus is 36.5 parts. The top billet is 2.5 parts down. The abacus plus its conge equals 7.5 parts in height and comes 2.5 parts inward from the fillet face. In this SketchUp model, I group the fillet and abacus because it is square in plan. When we eventually form the complete abacus, it becomes an independent SketchUp component. The 7.5 part tall Achinus detail creates the topmost portion of the circular in plan column and, carefully note, begins at 3.25 parts inward and then arcs down to the next 2.5 part tall fillet, which sits 10 parts inward. Especially notice that the center point of the Echinus arc begins at 10.75 parts inward and sits at 0.75 parts further back from the face of the fillet. Next, we can see that we have 10 parts left over for the neck and the conge. The neck sits 12.5 parts inward and transitions from the fillet above it with another conge with a 2.5 part radius. Once the capital profile is complete, we move down to the astragal and fillet that terminates the column shaft. The astragal is 2.5 parts tall and begins at 8.75 parts inward from the outer abacus edge. At a tiny 1.5 parts tall, the fillet below the astragal aligns with the fillet of the neck at 10 parts inward. Place a 180 degree arc to form the astragal and then place a vertical line for the fillet. The next task is to create a conge that transitions from the column shaft to that small fillet. The taper makes a slight angle where we want to meet the conge. From using a 2.25 part radius circle, it appears that the tangent to the shaft may be slightly less than that radius. I also give my circle 96 segments so that it appears as realistic as possible. In SketchUp, I group the circle to use as a guide, set it into place as closely as possible, and then slightly reduce the circle's circumference to create an arc that makes a perpendicular intersection to the fillet and a tangent to the shaft. Once there is a circle that fits that intersection, I explode it and take away the three-quarter arc that leaves the desired conge shape. I zoom in to check the tangent line and it looks good. I then fill in that portion just created and then erase the extraneous horizontals and guidelines. The Tuscan column profile is complete. With half the profile of the Tuscan column drawn, forming the whole column is relatively easy. First, take the abacus profile and give it four sides that measure 36.5 parts each. In SketchUp, you can extrude your profile into a square to create this topmost column element. The process for the plinth is similar. You extend the rectangle that we grouped earlier and give it 82.5 part sides. Now set a circle for the SketchUp Follow Me tool to trace. I also like to draw a diagonal at the bottom of the plinth so that you can easily center the completed column by grabbing that X mark point when you begin using it in a model. Now select the outline of that circle and click the Follow Me function and poof! You just created all the cylindrical parts of your Tuscan column. Next, I go in and make that plinth a SketchUp component. I select the cylindrical portions of the creation and establish it as a component as well. Do the same with the abacus group and then you have three distinct pieces to this creation. In SketchUp, components conserve processing power because they use fewer data bytes than groups. Finally, we will take those three pieces, the plinth, the cylindrical column parts, and the abacus, 
and finalize the Tuscan column that you can resize to any scale you desire. The last bit I want to illustrate for you is the relative scale for columns you create. As mentioned earlier, we designed this column with one inch parts. If you were to draw with one centimeter for each part, you would end up with a column that is 4.2 meters or 420 centimeters tall. That ratio makes our 35 foot tall column a multiple of 2.54 times larger than the 4.2 meter column because one inch equals 2.54 centimeters. Measurements become tricky in the imperial system. For example, the eight foot high column has fractions of inches in its various parts. Since the plinth is 15 parts tall and 96 inches gets divided by 420 column parts, each part is roughly one quarter of an inch. 15 quarters of an inch equals about 3.75 inches. And your plinth is therefore three and three quarters inches tall. With the metric system, for example, examine the 2.1 meter column. Each part is half a centimeter. Of course, if you desire an 8.4 meter tall column, each part is two centimeters. I caution you on increments you choose, and if you end up working with fractions of inches or decimals, you must maintain your parts honest to the classical system of order and proportion. Even if you use other software to create models or draw with paper and pencil, this demonstration should provide you a thorough examination of the Tuscan column according to Vanola.